The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Well, I had friends when I was in high school in preferred activities like horseback riding, electronics, or model rockets. And there's a tendency sometimes to just go on and on and on talking about the same thing. And this is where someone had to tell me, you're going to tell that story twice, and that's all that people are going to want to hear it. They're going to get bored with it after uh, hearing it tw uh, more than twice. Give them, say, hey, you know, you've talked too much about that robot. Let's talk about something else. Well, let's give some examples of things that are not perfect. Okay, if a photographer's working for the National Geographic, that would be at the pinnacle of photography career. But if you go through the National Geographic, you're probably going to find some technical errors like flare in some of the pictures. But overall, such a great picture, even though it had flare, you still use the picture. Also, if he's a science kid, bring up the concept of absolute zero, where all atomic motion is stopped. You can never get there, you can only approach it. You know, get the concept across of work up to a certain standard. It doesn't have to be perfect, it's got to be up to a certain standard. Well, when I was a young kid, there were expectations for doing things that other people want. It gets back to turn taking. Uh, yeah, I had to sit through church even though I thought it was boring. That's something the other members of the family wanted to do. And there were expectations for me not to be disruptive. And most of the time I behaved. You know, and that's just one step beyond turn taking in board games. You've got to learn to get your turn. Sometimes you get to pick out the movie, and other times a brother or sister may pick out the movie we go to. Well, one of my really important teachers, Mr. Carlock, my science teacher. And he had interesting projects for me to do. And I worked on all kinds of stuff with optical illusions. And that actually helped me in some of my cattle work because it made me pay attention to what the animals were seeing. And then that was uh, that doing interesting science projects got me motivated to study because now I had a reason for studying. Studying was a way to get to a goal of becoming a scientist. This is where a good teacher really turns the student around. Well, there's a lot of problems in the sensory system. Distorted input, sort of like uh, pictures pixelating with a bad satellite dish, uh, uh, audio cutting in and out like a really bad cell phone. Uh, a lot of the sensory systems are not working normally. In my book, The Autistic Brain, I've got a whole big section in there on sensory issues. And there's an interesting new study that's come out called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, I want to make it very clear, this does not replace ABA or speech therapy. It is an adjunct. And what's done in this, and there's a paper you can get online called Environmental Enrichment is Effective Treatment for Autism. You stimulate two senses at the same time, like maybe you do an aromatherapy, a cinnamon, something like that, touch carpet. You always change, always changing the pair of senses that you stimulate. And one of the senses is always one of the more primitive senses, smell, touch, or balance. So there's a lot of emphasis on eight different aromatherapies, and the people were, um, children were, di were uh, evaluated baseline. Controls got ABA and speech therapy. Experimentals got this additional sensory therapy. And then after uh, quite a few months, they evaluated them again, and the experimental group that had the treatment had significantly better behavior. This is a refereed scientific journal article. 
and it uses simple household things, very simple to do. Environmental enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. You can download it online. I'll tell you some things not to do. Don't say you went to sleep, because then the child might be afraid that you went to sleep. I, when I was very young, uh, we were out for a walk and came across a very flat squirrel in the middle of the road that had been run over. And it was very clear that the squirrel could not be put back together again. And that made me learn not to run out in the street because I wouldn't want to be like that squirrel. And there's no way the veteran, veterinarian could do surgery and put him back together again. I mean, basically, um, you know, death of a person, they are gone. They are gone. Well, I, Oliver Sacks is a very kindly uh, kind of professor type of person, and I, I read an article he wrote in the New York Times just before he died about you know the going back doing the Jewish Sabbath, and at the end of the article he was talking about well, if A then B then C, which way of his life could have gone down different paths, and I started really weeping when I read that article, you know, and I'm glad it went down the path that you know where our paths crossed. I could barely print it out, I was so um, upset. No, uh, fortunately, um, he was writing right up until the end. And he's uh, overall really satisfied with his life. Well, after the article appeared in the New Yorker magazine, uh, shortly after that, an agent uh, appeared that suggested that I ought to write a book. And that's what brought the book Thinking in Pictures into being. I'm Candace Cameron Bray. Tom Bergeron. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. So thank you for joining us. We're here with The Future is Bright, and we have a very special guest, Temple Grandin. Doctor, thank you for joining us. We're it's so excited good to, be here. to have you. Thank you. You just gave a great speech at the 46th annual conference here in Denver, Colorado, and we would love to take an opportunity to just ask you a couple of questions okay. about a hot topic for you now that is employment yep. and helping people with autism become gainfully employed and what we can do as they're growing up uh, you know, through the high school years and through those younger years, maybe before they're old enough to get a real job as you'd call it, what's your advice for parents out there and what they can do with their kids today to help them? The problem with autism is since they changed the guidelines for diagnosis in 2013, the spectrum has become extremely broad. At one end of the spectrum you're going to have Silicon Valley programmers, you know, really good artists, I mean really talented people, and at the other end of the spectrum you're going to have someone that's going to remain nonverbal with some very severe handicaps and it's all got the same word. You see, if you diagnose a kid with dyslexia, you still have a fully verbal kid with normal intelligence, can't read. ADHD, you know, you've got the hyperactivity and attention problems. It's a much narrower spectrum if someone is ADHD or they're um, dyslexic. Autism now, you've got this huge quagmire of a spectrum. And the only time I can give a specific recommendation across the whole spectrum is that a kid's two and a half or three with no speech you must start early intervention, 20 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one teaching. Uh, there's various ABA and other methods that work, but you've got to start. You've got to start now. I can give you a canned answer. But once a child gets older, they're kind of going, merging into three different groups. What are the groups? Well, you're going to have a kid that's going to remain nonverbal with very severe handicaps. And some of the ones that look very low functioning actually have a locked-in syndrome with normal intelligence inside. Okay. Then you have a moderate group where you've got some speech, but it isn't really normal speech. Reading might be, you know, fourth grade level, sort of like that. And then you've got the high-end group where they often are really smart in one thing, like math okay. or art or maybe verbal, and then they have a deficit in another thing. And the education system puts too much emphasis on the deficits, not enough, build, not enough emphasis in building up the area of strength. Mm -hmm. If you've got a third grader that's good in math, let's give them harder math and let's introduce them to programming. Okay. Because that's something that could turn into a job. You know, the programs that are hot right now are C++ and JavaScript, Ruby and Python. The courses are free online. But the kid's not going to get interested in that unless you introduce it. 
And who should be doing that? How do you recognize that you've got a kid with, let's say, a great math capability or great All art right, so the kid, you should give the kid the third grade math, he instantly learns it, let's get the fourth grade book out. Okay. Let's get the fifth grade book out. Let's get the sixth grade book out. If he can do the college book in third grade, fine, let him. Okay. He's probably going to need special ed. So reading. very early. Oh, yeah. Don't make him do baby math. He's going to get bored, and I guarantee you he'll be a gigantic behavior problem when he's bored. It, it sounds like you think there might be a little bit of a coddling issue where parents are concerned. Oh, I think there's a big coddling issue on just learning things like greeting. I'm really appalled at meetings where um, come to a meeting. Here is a 12-year-old completely and fully verbal that does not know how to shake hands. He doesn't know how to greet. You see, the manners in the 50s were taught in a much more structured way. Right. And teachable moments were used. Like if I picked up my potatoes uh, with my hand, and I'm not french fries, but mashed potatoes with my hand, mother would say, use the fork. Okay. She didn't scream no. She'd say, use the fork. That's a teachable Healthy moment. Healthy alternative. And, and um, I was at a very fancy dinner one time at a college, and there was a 12-year-old kid there, fully verbal, and the... Um, uh, he started to eat the food with his hands, and I just said, this is a fancy dinner. You're not eating like that in front of me. You use the utensils, and he did. So it's I just, just gave him the out. instruction. But you give the instruction. I didn't yell at him. You give the instruction. But there's a tendency to overprotect. I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids who don't know how to shop. Sure. Uh, they're not doing any chores in the home. Just basic things, greeting people. When I was eight years old, mother had me party hostess at her parties. And I had to greet the guests and serve the snacks. So it sounds like your mother had a lot of faith in your ability to just take those tasks that she was giving you and do them. Well, and she you're could saying, just, you got to stretch these kids. Stretch you see, them. the kids okay. getting labeled autistic, the baby am. them. And, and uh, you know, if you have a little kid, you know, that's, uh, you know, severe behaviors. I was severe behaviors when I was three years old. Sure. You know, of course, the parents are going to be upset about that. But then you got another kind of kid, 10 years old, no friends, geeky and nerdy, gets a label and not enough's being done to engage his area of strength sure. and teach him basic skills. Because what makes me crazy is I go back and forth between different silos. I'll do a talk out at Silicon Valley. You can go to the big tech companies. It's Asperger's everywhere, cube okay. after cube full of them. <laughs> Headphones okay. clamped on, don't even look up at you. I can go to the meatpacking plants. There's a whole shop full of hippies there, and I know they're on the spectrum. Okay. They've been there for years. This is what makes me crazy when I go out in the cattle world or the tech world or even the academic world and I find um, uh, older people my age, maybe 10 years old, that are on the spectrum, but they're okay. not diagnosed. So it sounds like you're saying in today's society, less helicopter parenting That's right. and more, you know, you must do this and, and reinforcing, these are the manners you need, this is how well, we you act. just treat them, you gotta move them just outside the comfort zone. I, I just met okay. a lady when I was down in Argentina I said, well, I can only shop at this one supermarket. It's on one newsstand. I can't go to another store. You know what I did with her? We watched Check out of that somewhere. meeting, and we went to a new newsstand. So and I brought through. her up to it, and I said, buy that magazine there. She wrung her hands a little bit, and she bought it. Okay. You so know, you made someone else walk through the proverbial I did. door. Good for That's you. Right. That's what I did. I did that last week. And you're encouraging parents to do the same thing with their kids And then now. we're going to be getting into looking at the job front. Okay, now that's something you just gave a great speech about. And it sounds like that's this new hot topic for you about how kids in their maybe early teens, maybe before they're really able to get formal jobs, should be out doing maybe the paper route type equivalent. Okay, we don't have paper routes anymore. In fact, I got asked... The equivalent. Just, I got asked the other day what a paper route is. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. And By I said, so, well, you know, they used to have children <laughs> deliver newspapers to people's sure. houses. And that taught really valuable skills. Okay. Okay, now we don't have that today. Well, How about walking some dogs for the neighbors? You can do that in the city. Okay. You know, but not your own dogs, somebody else's dogs. And you got to go over that at two different apartments at 6 o'clock in the morning, take those dogs out, walk them every day even when the weather's nasty. Or maybe um, uh, working in the farmer's market. Okay, we were just discussing uh, New York City where my mother lives. When I stay at the hotel in New York and I walk six blocks to my mother's apartment, I go by, by five or six street vendors. Okay. okay, a kid that's like 12 or 13 years old, have them help out a street vendor. They've got to start learning work skills. If they're out in the suburbs, they could help sure. out in the farmer's market. Okay. Let's start getting creative. Uh, let's start off with church and synagogue jobs, things like that. Church ushers, setting up chairs for the church social. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a job. Every Thursday night, you got to do those chairs. So it's the accountability, being somewhere where someone's expecting you to help out and do a particular so thing. It's a defined task. You've got okay. 100 chairs to put up. Defined. 
and you had a hundred chairs you're gonna have to put away after the event is over. So defined and repetitive and something that they do. Well, in, in a lot of jobs, the repetitive. The newspaper routes are repetitive, but let's go through my work history. These okay. kids have got to learn work skills outside the home before they graduate my school. Okay. All right, when I was 13, mother just in the neighborhood found a little seamstress that uh, okay. did dressmaking out of her home. And she went in and told about me. I was kind of different, sure. and but I was really good at hand sewing. So the lady started having me hand sew the hems and take apart dresses. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Okay. Then when I got a little bit older, I was making signs and selling them. And the first sign I ever made was for a beauty shop. Um, first sign I ever made for a customer. I had made some other signs before okay. that. But making things, and you have to learn how to make signs that other people want. And then even when I was getting my master's, I was making signs so at the carnival. And then my kids. aunt's ranch. At my aunt's ranch, there was some work stuff. I had to take guests out on trail rides, and I had okay. to do some, she had guests there. I had to wait so on tables there, too. you were accountable. You were given yeah. various tasks, and you were accountable. It sounds like that you're endorsing that we have our kids go out there when they're younger and do these you know, smaller jobs for people in the neighborhood or small business owners and learn those skills before they get okay, to the job Okay, now some states age. you can work in safe retail at 14. Okay. okay, a lot of other states at 16. Well, you know, let's say you got a friend of two blocks away, like a little tax accounting office. Sure, sure. They can put the kid to work in there. Perfect. You know, eh, you know cash economy. Something. They've got to learn work skills. And like, just look at the things they're in. Maybe it's a little snow, a little Something. coffee stand that's in the neighborhood. And the kid, when he's 12, can go help out with that. And he's expected there at certain hours every week. It's a job. Okay. And so that's the importance of it all, is just they to get them out there. They have to learn how to work. And when I was uh, 14, I got kicked out of school for fighting and throwing a book. Went to a very expensive boarding school. Spent three years of that time running up a horse barn and cleaning horse stalls. And what Mr. Patey, the headmaster, realized, I was learning job skills. That was super important. Which and then when I finally got interested in science and studying, I kind of did a year of high school in a year. Okay. But I had took, but I had been working in the horse barn, I had learned that the responsibility. Every afternoon, you got to clean every stall, put yep. them in and out, feed them. So it's responsibility. Have our That's parents right. allow their kids to get out there and just not be afraid to do it before they, they get. they got to get out. Okay. And the project search research is shown very clearly that working in a real job the whole year before they graduate from high school is very, very important for, for, for keeping employment for, uh, after they graduate. Okay, so along those same lines, now you've got a group of kids in today's society who have gotten out there and, let's say, worked at these little carts or local small businesses informally while yeah. they're younger, and they get older and they're able to get into the workforce. They need to get there. you got to get to your job. So you have to be able to drive if you can, if you're capable of driving. Talk to us about your stance on well, driving. Well, driving was essential for me. I would have never been able to go into the cattle industry without driving. There's a scene in the movie where I get kicked out of Scottsdale Feed Yard. I was yep. driving. It was beautiful. If I hadn't have been driving, I wouldn't have gone to Scottsdale Feed Yard to get kicked out of it. Yep. And so how did I learn to drive? How? My aunt's ranch. We were three miles to go up to the mailbox and three miles back. And she started having me drive up to the mailbox on a dirt road. Well, over the whole summer, that was six miles a day, six days a week, I put 200 miles on that truck driving just on this dirt road. Just to pick up the mail. Just to pick up the mail. <laughs> That's what we had to do. That's the way okay. it was on the ranch. The mailbox was three miles away. Okay. So that was 200 miles of driving. That's a tank of gas. And I hadn't been near any serious traffic at that point. Okay. Um, I think what you need to be doing is burning up a tank of gas in a totally safe place. Country dirt roads, giant big deserted parking lots, or open dry flat fields. Because there are some multitasking issues, and what the kid needs to do is he's got to learn how to operate that car before we go near any traffic. And the problem with driver's ed is they put them into traffic too fast. Mm -hmm. So I want to burn up this tank of gas in a totally safe place, then you do the driver's ed. Okay. So they fully learn how to steer, brake, stop. You can practice parking, practice all kinds of stuff because this deals with the problems with executive function and multitasking. See, when you learn a motor skill like driving, you first of all have to think about how to steer, how to brake, and how to use the gas. Mm -hmm. Now, as you practice it, you no longer have to think about it. It just goes in your motor cortex. Sure. Well, before we go near any traffic, I want operation of the car migrated into the motor cortex of the brain. Okay. 
So once that's second nature and a, and a kid goes out there and is learning how to drive on, let's say, this deserted road yeah, or this open right. parking lot, and they've got steering down and you want to maybe throw some things into the mix before they ever go into driver's ed, like it's raining, there's windshield wipers, and you need to look at your turn signal and, oh, by the way, you're about to park, those types of well, things. Well, then you start teaching them how to use the turn signals. Teach them everything. You just teach them everything. And, and, um, and then even after I got a car, I went to Franklin Pierce College, but that was on, out in the country. There was some traffic, but it was really mild traffic. So I was another year on easy roads before I did any really serious traffic. Also, um, like downtown Denver, I just absolutely hate coming here. I actually avoid the rush hour, but you see the airport route, I know exactly where the lanes are, where I have okay. to get over. It's a more comfortable uh, route. The airport's totally comfortable. Okay. You know, so like going to the airport's easy. And see all my agricultural jobs were out in the country. So. Sure. But, but even on Denver traffic, okay, I would learn a certain route. There's some really bad exits where you can get forced off. Yep. Well, then I got to learn where I got to get over when I'd learn the route. Um, but it's just going to take longer. So okay. I'm recommending a tank of gas uh, in a totally safe place before we do any driver's ed, a year on easy roads before okay. we do downtown traffic or crowded freeways. Uh, just a period of acclimation. It That's like. right. Okay. It's going to take longer. For multitasking skills in general, whether it's driving well, or... Well, tasking is a problem. You see, and the way to avoid the tasking is there's no tasking if the, the operation of the car is migrated out of frontal cortex back to the motor sure. cortex. So you don't have to think about driving the car. So you and, want that extra time. That's right. And then okay. turn signals. Well, you can practice that on even on my aunt's ranch where the, we okay. would go up to the mailbox. There was one turn to the mailbox mm -hmm. where I could practice a turn signal. Okay. Okay, so that's driving. That's now, right. Now, they can get to the job. They've learned how to drive. They've had their practice at, at manners at a young age and doing some of these informal jobs. Do you have specific advice for what we can tell adults with autism who feel like they've got the right skills to get Let's out into the Let's short circuit the interview process. Okay. Because when we were just talking about this at the tech conference I was just at sure. across the street with specialist cistern that... Um, company, a, a tech company that hires people on the autism spectrum, and they were talking about how they got to short circuit the interview process, and and the way that I would do interviews is I simply show off my portfolio. I'd show okay. pictures of things I designed, drawings, okay, if it's a programmer, it needs to show a computer in there, here's, okay, here's some C++ that code, and it does this, and I got some JavaScript, and it does this, and you just show off your portfolio. So maybe a different kind of interview That's process right. for people That's on right. the spectrum. And then once they get on the job, thing employers have to realize is you cannot be vague. There's a scene in the movie where my boss slammed down the deodorant and said, you stink, use it. That happened. Right. They got to clean up themselves. And I did it. And that boss, I'm pretty sure, was on the spectrum. But you said that. you appreciated that. Now, I was, was very direct. angry at the time. I was very angry and upset at the time. Okay. But I wanted the job. I thank that boss now. And I thank Linda Carpenter and her other secretary friend that took me out to buy the clothes. OK. So are there things that you would recommend to employers that they can do to be more receptive to people a with autism? A lot of people on the spectrum will need a quiet place to work. Okay. You know, some of these restrooms have these horrible Dyson blade sure. air hand dryers. Now, if my office cube was next to that, I wouldn't be able to work. I've got I to, wouldn't either. I've got to get away from <laughs> that. And a and, uh, quiet place to work. Also, clearly define the tasks. Okay. Even now, I mean, I'm, uh, when I do consulting, I've worked on a big manuscript with 15 other people. And I just said, I need homework. Okay, tell me I'll write this part of the manuscript, and I'll do it in this format, get it done on this date. Okay. Then, when I read through all the rest of the manuscript, I found some technical errors. You know, some things, there might be opinion. Mm -hmm. These were purely technical errors. Another person wrote, corrected them, no track changes, just sent it on in. Okay. Because you don't rub the other person's nose in their mistakes. Well, that's... Because I got in trouble for doing something. That's like. good practice anyway. Yeah. That's just nice, nice, uh, you know, social skills. Uh, so it sounds like then, to just recap it, for, for employers today to clearly define tasks for people on the that's spectrum right. who are coming into the workplace, that's a great way to be sensitive to helping them succeed. All right, let's say it's, a, it's programming. You don't just say develop new software. That's too vague. Right. They've got to write be some direct. code that does. You don't tell them how to write the code. That's up to the to the, the just, ASPE to do that. But what is the outcome? Okay, that's to go on a certain platform, be a certain language, sure. and it's got to achieve a certain outcome. Great. And there's some deadlines. Great. And deadlines, okay. Well, when I worked for the magazine, the deadline was so many column inches by the 15th of each month. 
and, and I was to cover a wide variety of livestock topics. Well, I think that that's great advice for, for employers out there because it's been a big question. And I, I know we, we're out of time, we have to wrap up, but it's been great to talk to you about just the employment issue in general. My advice to employers as an attorney would be give them a quiet place. Give them the well There's one tasks. other issue I want to talk about, and that's What's the that? video game addictions. I'm seeing way too many kids where uh, moms are coming to me. He says, he's 21, I can't get him out of the basement. And he's 18, okay. I can't get him out of the bedroom. Uh, we've got to limit the video game playing. Well, I think all parents sort of feel that way. And well, we've the, got to because they're not having good outcomes. The more, the more you limit the video games and the more you can do, like what you said, is to help socialize people. The more we spend one-on-one -on -one time like you and I have talking to each other face-to-face, -face, yep. the more we all benefit I'm by not, better social skills. I'm not suggesting banning video games, but the rule <laughs> for me was one hour of TV during the week and two hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday, so they can do it and that's some. A, and... That's and, a great um, way to wrap it up. That, but would, that's great you can't advice. let them play video games for eight hours a day. Well, of course not. Of course not. I think all parents would agree with you. But, but unfortunately, I'm seeing too many kids where that's happening. Okay. Well, it's good advice. It's good advice if you want to be successful in the, the employment industry. The other thing industry. is you've got to expose kids to enough different things. Like how's a kid going to find out he might like acting for a career if there's no school play? How's right. he going to find out he likes uh, oh my fixing gosh. cars if there's no auto shop? They've taken these things out of the schools. I think it's completely wrong. Kids are not getting exposed to enough different things to become careers. Okay. Okay. So lots of exposure. Gosh, thank you so much, okay. Temple. We appreciate your thank time. You. It's been fabulous. Thank you for joining us You're on The welcome. Future's Bright. so many parents who've asked questions and uh, okay. and they love your answers. I want to start with a, a question that we got on Facebook that somebody wants to know your views on inclusion. Well, I think a lot depends upon the particular situation. And for young children, elementary school children, I want to try to do inclusion as much as what's practically possible because little kids need to get the socialization. Now, I was one of these teenagers that in a big high school i i was teased to death uh it was just absolutely terrible it just absolutely did not work and i was one of the teenagers that had to be taken out of a big high school and and i um, you know where inclusion totally worked for me in elementary school i was in a in a little country school small very small classes it was very much it, it was a private school but it was very much like a small rural elementary school that i've seen in rural communities older experienced teachers and that worked really well um, but I was one of the ones that had to be taken out, and I went to special boarding school, and, and I've had some parents take their kid out and homeschool them. And all I want to say, if they homeschool their kid in high school, they cannot let them become a recluse in their room. When I went away to the special boarding school, I had a tendency to want to do that, and they wouldn't allow that. They let me do lots of different things that I wanted to do. And when I wanted to clean the horse barn, they got me insulated boots so my feet wouldn't freeze off. But I had to be at meals on time. Even though I didn't do much studying, I had to attend classes. One thing they absolutely would not allow was for me to become a recluse in my room. And I, I had to be out doing things. But there's some kids where getting away from the whole teenage scene is the best thing you can do and, and socialize with grown-ups. Yeah. Because I'll be perfectly honest, socializing with teenagers is not a life skill that I need. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of people would agree with you there, Temple. But on the other hand, I've seen situations where they decide to homeschool their teenager and he became a re video game recluse yeah. and ended up on Social Security going nowhere. Yeah. And that makes me nuts yeah. because when I go out into the technical world, there's old Aspies and there's old geeks and nerds out there that would be di definitely diagnosed on the spectrum today. Old gray hairs my age, and they've got jobs, yeah. jobs they like, and they've kept those jobs. Well, uh, we've got another parent who wants to know what you think about the recent statistics that somebody was quoted as saying that in 2012, that the numbers for autism at the, at the rate that we're growing could be as high as one in nine. 
and and what your thoughts are on those numbers. Well, some of it's just increased diagnosis. I mean, the kind of the geeks and the nerds and the Aspergers, they've always been around. Now, they're going to be changing the diagnostic criteria in May to take the mild, uh, you know, kind of socially awkward person and call them social communication disorder rather than autism which is really rubbish because the social communication problems are the core deficit in autism as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And, and um, so some of this is just increased diagnosis. Um, and I think there is some severe autism and severe problems that have increased. And there's also a good number of mental retardation that has now been called autism. Mm-hmm. You know, and mental retardation diagnoses have actually gone down. You see people seek the autism diagnosis to get services. And I think one of the reasons why in the DMS-5 they're changing, that they're taking out Asperger's, is they're trying to cut down on the amount of people labeled autism. I think the committee actually did that on purpose for that reason. Mm. And the problem is diagnosis is not precise. And in my new book, The Autistic Brain, Richard Panic and I are going to be going through the whole entire history of the diagnosis. It makes you kind of sick mm. because it kept changing You know, it's doctors sitting around a conference room table, you know, making decisions on this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have you had a chance to look at the DSM-5 temple? Do you? Uh, I looked at it when they had it posted on the webpage. I was able to look at it. It's now off the webpage. But I did have a chance to look at it. And basically, Asperger's is going to be removed. And most of the kids that are the Asperger's are going to be called social communication disorder. And they say that that's not autism, which is rubbish. And... And um, they're also getting very murky about the speech delay. Mm. All of it, like, more muddled and murky. And I, I'm just curious, when because I, I we all had that opportunity to look at it and, and to make suggestions. Do you feel like you would still be considered on the spectrum by yes. the, the DSM? You yes. would still qualify? I would. I would okay. definitely still qualify because I had severe speech delay. And when I was a young child, I had all the full-blown symptoms of classic autism. Rocking, spinning, tantrums, no eye contact, fixated interest, repetitive behavior. Because, uh, uh, because basically on the DSM-5, there's two things you've got to have. You've got to have the social communication problems, and then the other thing is the repetitive behaviors and fixated interest. Yeah. And I definitely had that. Okay. There's no, I would definitely still be diagnosed. Okay. And um, which kind of leads into the next question. One of our viewers wants to know what problems that you still face being autistic. Oh, well, I don't multitask well. Um, that's still a problem I, I face. And fortunately, I have a job that doesn't require multitasking or remembering long strings of verbal information. Mm. You know, it's um, uh, antidepressants have controlled uh, anxiety for me. Um, you know, I'm a visual thinker, and us visual thinkers tend to get a lot of anxiety problems. Mm-hmm. And a low dose of an antidepressant, some people a little Prozac, Zoloft, or Lexapro. I'm on an old-fashioned tricyclic. Just a little tiny dab stops that constant panic attacks and anxiety. And, and you have to use very low doses, because if you use too high a dose, you get agitation and insomnia. And if you're interested in that, I'd recommend that you read A Believer in Biochemistry. That's a chapter in my book, Thinking in Pictures, mm-hmm. or read the second edition of The Way I See It book. Spectacular. Wonderful. And uh, in particular, this, this same viewer was asking, uh, what, what really has helped you to become the person that you are today? Was it therapy? Was it social therapy? And what, what do you feel is the, the main reason that you've had so much progress in your life? Well, first of all, I had superb, excellent early intervention. And the kind of early intervention that was done with me when I was totally nonverbal, I did not talk completely fluently until age four. I had a lot of ABA-type therapy. Mm. It wasn't called ABA back in those days, but a lot of things like my speech therapist would hold up a cup and say, say cup. When I was three, my mother hired a nanny who played constant turn-taking games with Mm. me and my sister, constantly keeping me engaged. And, and my ability in art was always encouraged. You know, my abilities were encouraged. And I, would have, I used to just draw endless horse heads, and I was encouraged to draw lots of other things. And, and, um, you know, and limits were set on me. Like um, uh, if I had a tantrum at school, the rule was no television that night. That was the rule, and it was enforced. Great teachers in elementary school, a very, very good, just older, old-fashioned teachers in an old-fashioned 50s-style classroom, then when I went to high school, it was my science teacher, Mr. Patey, the head of the, 
boarding school. Mr. Patey had a really good sense of when to let me off the hook and not study, but he was not going to let me become a recluse in my room. Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, it was a whole lot of things. And then I, there were some good people in the cattle industry. I mean, the movie makes it look like everybody in the cattle industry was just awful. There were excellent, good people. Jim the contractor, Ted Gilbert at the Red River Feed Yard. There were some excellent ranches that did treat cattle right. And, and there were some good people. And that, uh, that kept me going. But people are always looking for the single magic turning point. There's not one. The other thing that really helped me, learning work skills. Mm. When I was 13... Mother had me doing a little sewing job two afternoons a week in a lady's house, and I took apart dresses and hemmed them. When I was 15, I was cleaning eight horse stalls. I was doing carpentry work. When I was in college, I did an internship at a research lab where I actually had to rent my own house. You see, you've got to stretch these kids. Yeah. I'm seeing too many people on the mild end of the spectrum today, people a lot milder than me, they are playing video games on Social Security because they were never stretched. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I mean, I, yeah, the, my take on video games is one hour a day. Okay. I was allowed to play a 50s video game when I was a little kid for one hour a day. And that 50s video game was spinning a brass thing round and round and round that, that covered up a bolt on my bed. Mm. And I was allowed to do that for an hour after lunch, to just veg out and do that. Well, that's the same thing that ought to be done with video games, one hour a day. I love that prescription. And, I'm going to play this for my son, and, Temple. And I, I, uh, I would not, never recommend banning them. Actually, there's some visual spatial skills you can learn from video games. I just was reading an article in one of my science or nature magazines. But that article, where there was a benefit in playing video games, it was only one hour a day they did. Okay. It wasn't eight hours a day. Yeah. Well, I, I love that because a lot of us parents are asking questions and saying, what's an appropriate amount? And, and an hour oh. seems like a great, it's, it gives them time to play, that's right. but puts a limit on it. So I, I love exactly that. That's what, exactly what mother did with me with spinning things. I was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could go in my room and I could spin things, twirl the brass plate on my bed round and round and round, watch it twirl. And then, and then after I came out of my room, I was not allowed to do the, that. I got to ask you, Temple, what was it about the spinning that was exciting enough for you to, ha to do it for an entire hour? Do you remember what it was oh, about? Oh, yes, I remember. It, it, um, I, could, I, could, I could twirl it. It was sort of a hanging brass plate mm -hmm. that was on a screw that covered up a bolt that held the bed frame together. And I'd spin it at different speeds. And I'd watch how it went back and forth when it stopped spinning all the way around. Hmm. And I would, do, I would experiment all different kinds of speeds of it. And I just sort of studied it like a scientist. Wow. And I found it fascinating. Another thing I did is I dribbled sand through my hand. We'd go to the beach. Mm. And I'd dribble sand through my hand, and I'd study every little rock of the mm. sand that went through my hand. And I would just stand there all day, and, I'd, and I would dribble the sand at different speeds. You know, hold my fist tighter or hold my fist looser and just study it. It's just fascinating, and it kept your attention. Oh, yes. And, and um, I, was, I was given some limited times to mm -hmm. do these things, mm -hmm. and it was, but it was on a schedule. Yeah. After lunch, I had an hour where I was in my room and I could do this stuff. And then at the table, it was absolutely not allowed. Church, it was not allowed. In the classroom, it was yeah. not allowed. And, and when you, how did, how did they work through, how, what was it like for you transitioning? Was it just that you understood that it was an hour and then it was over? Well, I understood, I understood that, and it was, you see, you see, but this kind of having a schedule started very young. Okay. I mean, when the nanny had, we had three meals every day, and they were on time. Breakfast at 7, lunch at noon, dinner at 6. So and structure was, was really important. I had structure, but sometimes, you know, things changed, and mm -hmm. I didn't usually throw, I, I got nervous about changes. When I was in high school, and I was going full-blown on anxiety attacks, they wanted to change the schedule around mm -hmm. in high school. I got all nervous about that. Um, now they, I've had to move out of my office. We have a mess now where they're rebuilding our building, mm -hmm. remodeling our building, and we had to move all our offices. My 22 years of junk in my faculty office, and then we moved into trailers Wow! for a year. Well, I did that, but you know what? I did it slowly. Okay. Like three months before it was time to move, I was detrashing my office. And fortunately, they, they provided gigantic industrial-sized garbage cans to, for all the faculty to detrash their office because the entire faculty had to move out of this building. Yeah. But I did it slowly. 
You know what strikes me, Temple, is that that transition would be hard for anyone, but you are so good at recognizing what you need to be kind to yourself and to be successful, and then you do that. And I don't know that That's the rest of us do that. Well, and I did it, and fortunately they had these big garbage cans because, I hate to say it now, my knees are so are getting bad, and I can't lift, I can't walk upstairs lifting anything because my knees are going screaming, ouch, mm. don't, you're hurting yeah. your knees. And, and um, you know, I would have had to, I, I simply can't carry all the stuff. Yeah, but it, but you, you know where your strengths are, and you know how to compensate when you have an area that isn't a strength, and that's that's something that we can all learn from. Well, and you have to, I've learned things in organization. I, I Like for my calendar, I've got to have a calendar where I can see an entire month. Yeah. I hate those calendar books where it's a new page for each day. Hate them. Hate yeah. them. <laughs> oh, I get those from American Express and I just give them away. I hate yeah. them. Uh, and, and by the week doesn't help you either. You need to see the whole month. I want to see a whole month. Wonderful. I'm looking and see, and then when I make my plane reservations, I can look at that calendar and then I visualize how much time I'm going to need between events. And I know that, and let me tell you, I know all the airline routing now. I'll bet you do. Yeah, I have that about memorized. <laughs> I'll bet you do. I, I've got a question here that you, you might decide is too personal and you don't need to answer it if you don't want to, but somebody okay. wants to know what role faith and spirit, spirituality plays in your life. Well, when I was young, I did a lot of thinking about a lot of the big questions, but basically now I figure the meaning of life is if the things that you do help make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm, I have to use specific examples because I think very concretely. When a mother says, your book helped my kid go to college, mm -hmm. that makes me happy. Yeah. Or you solved my kid's sensory problems. And boy, I can tell you, we've got to look at sensory problems. Yeah. And there's some individuals that can't tolerate a noisy Walmart. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some tips on sensory problems to help desensitize. Let the individual initiate the dreaded buzzer on the scoreboard or the worst ringtone on a phone or whatever the thing is they can't stand. If the person on the spectrum initiates it or if they hate Walmart, let them uh, control how much Walmart they got to tolerate. And when they give a signal, you take them out. I because love that. Because you kind of have to stretch it. Yeah. And then there's some individuals that will never tolerate that Walmart, yeah. especially some of your nonverbal individuals. Yeah. Well, you know, that's great advice, Temple, because we've had a couple of parents, one parent in particular who's written in and talked about how her son, his lunch and his physical education take place in an old-fashioned gymnasium that has all wood floor, and it's very oh, no. echoey in the room, and that it's hard for him. He's supposed to be socializing during lunch, but there's all this echoey he can't, noise. Well, the problem is he cannot hear. Oops. I cannot hear in that environment either. Yeah. When I'm in a meatpacking plant, I cannot hear. I have got some auditory processing problems. I don't hear hard consonants. So when I'm in a meatpacking plant and we have to talk, I said, we got to go outside. I can't. I just tell him I can't hear. Yeah. And, and one of the problems he's got in that echoey gym is he simply cannot hear what other yeah. people are saying because there's auditory problems. The other thing, if you wear earphones or, or earplugs in the noisy gym, you've got to have those earplugs off for at least half the time because mm. otherwise your brain will get more and more and more sensitive mm. you know so half the day when it's quiet get that headphone off and get those ear earplugs out and w well one of the things that we had recommended too is going in and recording what it's like in the gymnasium and and maybe slowly desensitizing but that can help and now, what i'm hearing from you is to let the child turn the sound on and turn it off to desensitize. put it on the recorder put it on the recorder but let the child turn it on and off and that will help desensitize it so it'll tolerate the gym. Yeah. But what it will not do, it's not going to solve the problem with hearing conversations in the gym. Yeah. It will just make it so he can tolerate the gym. The other thing is, the other big problem in so many schools is fluorescent lights. Yeah. That's a serious problem for maybe 10% of the people on the spectrum. See, the problem we've got in the sensory stuff, it's so variable. Yeah. One kid's got visual problems. Another kid's got touch problems. Another kid's got auditory problems and fluorescent lights uh, 60 cycle fluorescent lights are just the worst and if you're in a classroom with that then get the the kids desk over by the window or if you're stuck in a room with no windows and fluorescent lights get some incandescent light bulbs in old lamps just get some old floor lamps bring them in from home put them next to the kids desk the other thing that can help is um try Try printing books and things on different pastel papers. Mm -hmm. Experiment with the colored backgrounds on computers. 
and also experiment with colored glasses, like the Erlen colored glasses. But that's way too expensive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So just experiment with Walmart's blue-tinted ones, uh, some pink glasses, some okay. uh, pale tans, you know, real pale different sunglasses. Just experiment with that. Interesting. I, I know a lot of schools have the their um, for children who are dyslexic. They have um, it almost looks like a paint chip fan that has different colored plastics that you can put over text for a child that, to be able to read with dyslexia. Helps. And that helps too. And some of the autistic kids need to try that. Okay. Great. And and then if then for these kids that that need that colored paper, um, if if the if the if the classroom has windows. Mm -hmm and there's fluorescent lights in the room, put that kid's desk over by the windows, okay. and that will help a lot. That's okay. a real simple thing you can do. Great advice. We had a bunch of questions come in about potty training, um, about children who get obsessed with different parts of potty training, and for instance, one child that the, the mom reports that she wants to play in the toilet water and wants to flush it constantly, but does not want to pee in it. And another parent wants to know, is it common for kids with autism not to want to use the bathroom, and why? All right, let's start out with um, sound sensitivity. See, when it comes to running water and flushing the toilet, some kids love it, and there's other kids that are terrified of mm -hmm. the noise. Mm -hmm. And the, oftentimes you'll have a child that will use the toilet at home, but he won't use the one at school. Mm -hmm. And the problem you've got at school is they have those industrial ones that yeah. are really, really super loud. Yeah. And I can tell you the worst toilets, vacuum toilets on planes. Oh, yes. if I had been exposed to that as a child, I would have been terrified. I would have been sure I would have been sucked out of the airplane. <laughs> that Absolutely. And I, I, I use them, and I use them all the time, and I press the button and I grit my teeth. Mm -hmm. I tolerate them. Yeah. But that uh, they, I can just, uh, I can go, it, they try to find flights for some of these kids that don't have a vacuum toilet. They have the old-fashioned blue juice one because <laughs> those vacuum toilets, they are scary. Oh, they are. So, you see, that is 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 a noise sensitivity problem okay now let's the other problem you have especially with a nonverbal child is he doesn't know what you're supposed to do in the toilet you see their sensory system is so fragmented and if you want to understand this you need to get tito muckapetahay's book how can i talk if my lips don't move mm -hmm. And Tito's a nonverbal person with autism that types independently and he describes a scrambled sensory world you know, it's sort of like looking at everything with Picasso vision. And he describes that when he had to learn how to put on a T-shirt, it had to be put on him very, very slowly so he could get what the whole task was mm. of going through the head hole, going through the armholes. And, and one of the things you got to do with someone like that is demonstrate how to use the toilet slowly. Okay. And he's got to see the entire thing. Like, how does the stuff get in the toilet? He's got to see it. Okay. You can't leave anything to the imagination. They got because he's got to watch the whole task. Okay. Otherwise, they won't understand what they are supposed to do. Well, he, that's great them, advice. You can't break it up into steps. You've yeah. got it's got it's what I call whole task training. Yeah. It's great advice because I, I think, you know, we're, we all are so uh, concerned about privacy and but making sure that somebody models the whole task. It maybe isn't and the prettiest see thing. How the waste comes out of the person and drops yeah. in the toilet okay, because correct. that step is often left out. I have talked to parents where their child would do it in front of the toilet, then pick it up and put it in the toilet. Right. Uh, it it uh, they because they and they did that because they didn't understand the task. And when you read Tito's book, How Can I Talk When the Lips Don't Move, about how he describes learning how to put a T-shirt on. Mm -hmm. I've, and, he, and he describes a fragmented visual world. I think you'll understand better on working with some of these kids. Interesting. Okay, we will definitely look into that book. Yeah. Um, we have a bunch of people who wrote in and specifically just wanted to thank you, Temple. I, I can't leave that out because uh, so many people wrote in and said that your lectures and your books have helped them. I certainly am one of those parents. Um, but. Uh, a couple of parents wrote in and wanted to know what your feelings were about the Sandy Hook massacre now that it's, there's been a little bit of time and uh, how you feel about the way society looks at individuals with autism. Well, that guy had a lot of the classic symptoms and he's a, an example of a kid that was allowed to become a recluse in his room playing violent video games. 
and then he was playing violent video games, shooting the same gun that he used for the actual crime. Uh, what should have been done with that kid? He should have had a job at a computer store. Mm. Get your butt out of the house, and you're going to work in a computer store. And that should have been done with him when he, when, you know, you're going to take him out and homeschool him? He should have been working in a computer store. Yeah. These kids have got to learn how to work. Yeah. And that is something that started with me at 13. And when you look at my Different Not Less book, mm -hmm. um, I, I, um, Different Not Less is 14 old gray hairs like me. <laughs> that were diagnosed later in life, and that gave them a huge, wonderful insight into their marriages and their relationships. But one of them, who was a computer specialist, her boss asked her, well, if you'd been diagnosed earlier, would you have become an expert computer person at Intel? Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that worries me. These kids are not learning any work skills. And just about everybody in Different Not Less had paper routes. Yeah. And I know that those are gone. You know what the new paper route is? Dog walking. There you go. That's a great job for 12 year olds. <laughs> How about swimming pool cleaning, especially if you live down south? Because I want something that's not seasonal. Yeah. You know, mowing lawns is good, but it's seasonal. Yeah. But these kids have got to learn how to work. Absolutely. Um, uh, museums will take kids as young as 12 years old for tour guides. Okay. Um, you know, uh, you have to be 16 to volunteer an animal shelter. They have got to learn work skills. And yes, volunteer work does count. Well, and our, our entire topic this week, we're talking about on the show transitioning from teenage years to adulthood. And, and some of the things that we're talking about are job related because I think on everybody's wish list for every child is that they be a productive member of society. Well, In the thing that drives me absolutely nuts is when I go out to a meatpacking plant, there's gray hairs like me all over that meatpacking plant that run the maintenance department. They do all kinds of jobs there, not just working on the line. That's like grunt work. Uh, and there's there's spectrum as they could be, but they're undiagnosed. Yeah. And half of Silicon Valley is on the spectrum. You know, it, it's where people have got to learn work skills. And then you have the kids, you know, there's different kinds of minds. There's the visual thinkers like me, going to be really good at building things. There's a lot of these kids that ought to be going to the skilled trades. We have a huge, huge shortage of auto mechanics. Mm. And one of the worst things the schools ever did taken out auto shop and metal shop and wood shop and art and all of those cooking, all of those hands-on classes that can turn into great careers. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, and then sometimes we can do too many accommodations. Like here's, here's one that's a, too much of an accommodation. There's a little elementary school kid that doesn't, that's too shy to get up and do his public speaking in class so they let him do it on Skype. I'm going, no way. You're going to have to get up in front of the class. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, when I gave my very first talk in graduate school, you know what I did? I panicked and I walked out. Mm. My very first talk. But then what I learned after that, got to have really good slides. And then if you freeze, you've got your slides. Oh, that's great, because we actually had a question from somebody wanting to know, what are your tricks to get over fear of public speech? So having slides that you can go to and take a moment? Well, let me just explain what we do with my students, because our my graduate students have to, you know, do their little 10-minute presentations at the American Society for Animal Science, where they tell about their research. And the thing I work with my students on is having really good PowerPoint slides. You know, where you start out with the reason for doing the research, the methods, you know, the animals, the statistics, the procedure, the results, the discussion, the conclusions, and nice pictures on your slides, and then enough writing on your slides so if you panic, you read them. There you it's go. It's not the end of the world for your first talk. Yeah. And you've, you've talked in so many different venues now, and we've shown your TED Talk more than once here on the show because it's brilliant. And I just wonder, how, was that, were you extra nervous for that, or, or was it just fine? Did you feel at home? I would I think was, that would I be was, panicking. <laughs> I was okay because I've done talks in enough big places, mm -hmm. and I was okay, okay with that. The only thing at the TED Talk I had problems with is, the, is well, they wanted me to wear this mic that was tight, mm -hmm. taped to my face. Mm. And I, I said to him, I've got to wear that for half an hour beforehand to get used to it. And I did that, and they had a lot of lights, which yeah. I don't really like, but I tolerated it because <laughs> I wanted it I wanted it to look good, and they wanted it to sound good. Yeah. And that's why they taped the mic to my cheek. Well, it did look good, and it sounded great, and you were brilliant. And we, we love that TED Talk. Um, I have an, another viewer who her question is, 
how can I learn to control involuntary movements? I have trouble with it and it's very distracting. And what you have to try to do is to turn it into an involuntary movement that doesn't bother people. Mm. I know a guy that has Tourette's and you'd never know it because he twitches his mouth and his eye. Mm. And it's something that, yeah, he does it every 30 seconds, but nobody notices. I never noticed it until he told me about it. If you can try to switch the involuntary movement into something that's less uh, uh, distracting. You know, there's a lot of people that sit in meetings and they jiggle their leg in yeah. meetings. Have you ever done that? Oh, yes, absolutely. And there are people who click their pens. Well, that gets annoying. It does. <laughs> and I do a lo awful lot of doodling. That's great. Where I just take a pen and I'm drawing circles and I'm drawing little triangles and, and stars and stuff on a piece of paper. You know, you could do that. You could get a fidget ball. I think what you need to try to do is to try to turn that into something. Uh, because what can be done with Tourette's is, to, is you can't get rid of the ticks. What you do is you change them into something else okay. that's a lot less annoying and distracting. Okay. And what this guy did is he took a bad verbal tech and he turned it into twitching his mouth and his eye every 30 seconds. And nobody notices it. There you go. Wonderful. Okay. Another viewer wants to know, what's your experience with fragmented vision, seeing only the details of things and not the whole picture? They report that, she says, I see so many details, but I can never just see the whole object that I'm looking at. And I'm wondering uh, what this is and how to understand it. Well, I had a student that had that problem and she was not autistic. She was dyslexic. And, mm. and I remember one time we were sitting at a traffic light next to this art store and I say, Artarama, that's a funny name for store. And she said, all I saw was the A. Mm. And uh, Tito describes this, you know, and how can I talk, my lips don't move. Donna Williams in her book, Autism and Inside Out Approach, describes um, this problem. Now, I don't have this. This is where autism is very, very, very variable. Mm -hmm. It's real, real variable. And I don't have this problem. It, it's, um, you know, this is something that, um, I, you know, not everybody on the spectrum has. Mm -hmm. But that they can go to those resources and maybe learn some more about it and what yeah. to do about it. So Tito's book again. That's um, right. I... Uh, there's somebody who wrote in, and I, I'm unaware of this. Apparently, they're, you are very good friends. Wait, wait. Somebody said my door. I'm going to have to let them in. Just a minute. Okay. We'll hold on. Uh, I'll let all the viewers know that who we're talking to right now is Temple Grandin, if you're just tuning in. She's joining us via phone, and she's answering parent questions that you guys have written in. And it's a very ex exciting opportunity for us to be able to talk with her, and we hope we'll have more opportunities to do this. So if you haven't written in a question uh, for Temple Grandin, and you still want to do because we keep a pool of them so that if we have the opportunity to talk to her again. Oh, she... Sorry, this is where I don't multitask very well. Oh, no, I thought you did very well. Are you kidding me? Okay. And we were just filling our viewers in on what was happening. So, um, but do you have a few more minutes to talk, Temple? Yes, I do. Okay, great. So um, somebody wrote in and said that you have, uh, that you're good friends with somebody who's blind. Yes. And, um, and that their best friend is blind. And their question is, um, do you narrate and describe scenes with ease to the friend that's, that's blind? Um, and does that build trust between you? Um, because this, uh, the person reports that they're very inspired by the fact that you also have a friend that's blind. Well, she was my, my roommate. And, um, we would used to go to movies, and mm -hmm. I'd sit in the we'd sit in the back row, and I would whisper to her what was the what the visual parts of the movie. Mm. How beautiful! And then we and then she had a radio that would pick up TV signals, mm. and we used to watch Star Trek on her radio. How wonderful! And Star I Trek was pretty good on the radio because I knew what the visuals looked like. And was it easy for you to describe those things to her? Yes, that was very, very easy because I'm a total visual thinker. There you go. So it was very, very easy for me to describe the visuals to her. What a gift to each other. You, yeah, you we must were, have been. she was the best roommate I ever had. And Temple, is it, uh, is it easy for you to have friends? Is it something that you struggle with or is it something that you're really adept at now? Well, my, most of my friends are through shared interests. And one thing I really recommend to all the parents out there, get autistic kids or kids that have got whatever diagnosis they got, whatever labels on them, get them involved with things with shared interests. Mm -hmm. School play, band, school newspaper, art club, computer club, robotics, Future Farmers of America, 4-H. 
Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, get involved in activities where they have a shared interest. I think that's great advice. We actually had a parent write in on Friday about having a teenager and how there aren't supports, but that she has him in a, a, a sailing club and a couple of Good. other clubs. Good. And um, and we had said, you know, clubs are great. Um, so she she felt like maybe, but she's wanting something more. And, and I know you talked earlier about volunteering to get them ready for job skills. Is there anything else we should be focusing on with our teenagers? Well, middle school, we need to start focusing on job skills. And volunteer work does count, and I think it needs to be work outside the home. You know, it could be a tour Important. guide, it could be, um, uh, you know, cleaning the swimming pools, walk some dogs. People that live in the city, live in, a, in, a, in an area where there's a lot of dogs around, walking dogs is, the, as far as I'm concerned, that's a new paper route. Okay. We need to be giving these kids a job that's a lot like a paper route, where they got to do it every day and have that responsibility of doing it. And does it need to be something that is in their area of interest, or it just is a job and they get paid for it? Or Sometimes they... it needs to just be a job. I don't think cleaning pools would be in anybody's interest. Yeah. But sometimes they just need to do a job. Okay. They need to learn how to work. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of our kids on the autism spectrum, they have a really good work, work ethic, especially those that have had a great deal of ABA. They sort of get it, that my time is taken up doing this right now. Um, but I do see that as you get into those teenage years, it gets a little bit rougher. Well, I don't think, you see, first of all, I, gave, I watched a big, long talk with Kristen Smith, who's a specialist in ABA, and he said basically ABA is a little kid's program, you know, unless, they're, unless it's real severe autism. Uh, and and you know you get most people on the higher end of the spectrum i mean they're beyond aba yeah we need to be um but they need to learn work skills absolutely uh we we have a viewer who wants to know when you're coming back to portland oregon i don't know i don't have anything scheduled oh wait a minute i've got i've got a, on my book tour i got some stuff scheduled. Wait a minute, I've got to see if I am coming to Portland. I know I'm coming into Seattle. Let me just look at my book tour schedule for the autistic brain. Um, let me just look. Um, Portland, on the 26th of June, I'll be in at Powell's Bookstore on the okay. 26th of June. Okay, great. So that's when you will be in Portland. Yeah, that's and when I, I'll be in Portland. I know you've got a bunch of different events that are coming up, places that you're speaking. I know you're getting ready to speak in Dallas um, yeah. the, week, the week right before Easter. Is there anything else, a place that you're going that you'd like to tell our viewers about where they can get to meet you? Well, I... I uh, going to a lot of different places, and I'm not that good about getting everything up on the web page. That's okay. I mean, people can search, and and um, I, you know, I mean, I was able to see that you. Were I can be tell you some of the places I'll be at for the book tour for the autistic brain. Okay. I will be on the 21st of May. I'll be at L.A., Los Angeles, um, at the University at Riverside, okay. and then on the 27th of May, I will be at the Los Angeles Public Library. And then um, I'll be in New York. I've got a, um, I'll be in New York. Uh, they've got me um, on the 29th and the 30th, but I don't know where. I'll be in Washington, D.C. On, on the 1st of May. Um, I'm not sure where yet. I'll be at LaSalle University outside of Philadelphia on the 3rd, also at the Philadelphia Public Library. Pensacola, Florida, on the 14th of May. Um, I'll be at an Asperger meeting. Oh, wait a minute, that's in Sydney, Australia. You don't want that. Oh, yes, we have viewers that watch us in Australia. Well, okay, well, I'll be at Sydney, Australia, Asperger Association. Uh, that's going to be the 1st of June. Okay. And then... Um, San Francisco on the 5th of June and the 4th of June. 4th and 5th of June in San Francisco. Atlanta on the 19th of June. You do you do get around, don't you, Temple? You're yeah, a very no. busy lady. You're I'll racking up some miles. 
I'll be at the Tattered Covered Bookstore in Denver on the 27th. I love and, that store. Okay, so that's some of the places I'll be at for the book tour for the Autistic Brain. Okay. And uh, people can also, um, and the publicist is Taryn Roeder at, um, at Houghton Mifflin. Okay. So if people, that's a great opportunity for them to come and have an opportunity to meet yes. and greet with you and get a book yes. signed perhaps, and which is a that's lovely right. thing because people do want to meet you, Temple. It's, yes. uh, you know, I was very excited to meet you uh, about a month ago, and and everyone was so excited to ask me about what it was like meeting you. And I got to say, it was one of the highlights of my life, Temple, to meet well, you. Thank you. Really, thank you. really remarkable. And since you're going to be in LA, <laughs> maybe we could talk about if you have an extra couple of minutes, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Um, Probably will not have time to do okay. that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll 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 sacrifice that because we get time to talk to you on the phone from time to time. Um, but one more question that I have for you, okay. Temple. Um, because I know you have to go, but um, for we we have a lot of people who've written in and asked questions about um, the teen years and about dealing with love interests. And well, the uh, teen years uh, were the worst part of my life. And I would recommend that they get a book that I did with Sean Barron called The Unwritten Social Rules. Mm. I was the kind of teenager, I was a pure geek who wasn't interested in those things, where Sean was. Mm -hmm. And Sean didn't know how to deal with it. And and I, most of the marriages where things have worked out well, it's been through shared interests. Yeah. You know, two computer people or two people that like dogs or whatever, whatever their interest is. And uh, also, they've got to learn the certain rules. You don't want to get busted for stalking. Right. You certainly don't want to get on a sex offender website. Right. There are some very, very strict rules. And the thing that's interesting is I'm very different from Sean. We were the same on sensory problems, fixated interests. That was all the same. But where we were different is Sean had, had so much more social interest mm -hmm. than I do. And in that book, Sean tells his story in his words. I tell my story in my words. And then Veronica Zisk is the editor. And I think uh, teens dealing with those kind of issues will find that book helpful. Okay. And what's the name of the book again? Unwritten Social Rules. Okay. And it's published by Future Horizons out of Texas. Wonderful. Temple, I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to do, do it again in the coming months. And I, I look forward to hearing about all the different places that you're going to be. And we'll stay in touch. That sounds great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Temple. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.